gentlemen. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, homeopathy and also uh, about uh, metal toxicity as it relates to dentistry and um, the general concepts of uh, homeopathy as we use it in dentistry. Um, in Tuscaloosa, I did uh, microbiology, learned uh, basically about germs and how we can't get rid of them. They mutate constantly. They even share genes with us. They share genes with viruses. Viruses share genes with us. So it's really a fluid environment. And we can't really wage war on them the way we're doing now. So we have to live with them and we have to improve our method in improving the terrain that they live in, including our mouths, of course. Um, that's why chemotherapy or chemicals used to combat germs are really not that sound of an idea, but improving the terrain, general body terrain, uh, immune system and oral hygiene, that will have a better effect. In Germany, I did uh, my dental school, and there, of course, uh, in Göttingen, we have the uh, world famous Max Planck Institute. A lot of uh, homeopathic uh, ideas came from Germany. Um, and, of course, um, we. Two years after I graduated, they phased out them all. When I was there, they still used them all. Uh, but they were, in, in, in general, Germany is very open to um, holistic uh, practices. Um, and uh, I will talk a little bit about uh, the different modes of homeopathy that uh, rose from Germany. There's a general misconception about homeopathy. Homeopathy is not naturopathy, or it's not herbs. Uh, it's a specific form of energy medicine. And it comes from the Greek uh, omios and pathos, which means similar suffering. And it is based on very high dilutions of a substance. And um, they can be made from anything, uh, mainly the basic animal, plant, mineral, even radiation. Uh, sun, there's a remedy made from the sun. Uh, we use the, the radiation remedy if someone is taking a lot of x-rays, uh, they're worried, and they can take it for a longer period of time or just on that day. A lot of uh, remedies are made from toxins, and because the human mouth is also a source of toxins nowadays, uh, not only from the bacteria, but also from metals, uh, it's important to see how the homeopathic remedies interact with the toxins. Of course, when we use homeopathy, we use diluted toxins, which uh, means that they're really not found in the remedy anymore, it's just a vibration. If you look in history, uh, I know I said before that it, uh, the father of homeopathy and a lot of homeopathic ideas arose from uh, Germany, but uh, in history, homeopathy has been referenced. Uh, when Moses came down uh, the mountain carrying the... Uh, um, the tablet. He found that uh, his people were engaging in um, decadent behavior. They were, you know, having fun beyond themselves. Uh, who knows what? And, and they were worshiping the golden cup. And uh, what he did was he ground it down and he mixed it in the water they drink and gave it back to the people. So that. If you look at the gold remedy, it's, it makes sense because uh, gold, if you uh, look at its description as to what effects it produces, reckless children who are inclined to transgress father's laws or full of ambition, the daredevil who will defy even divine law. This is from D. Pierre Grand George's book. Very interesting. and. Uh, I'm sure Moses didn't know about these back then, but he knew something. Uh, we use the gold remedy for upper jaw infections and depression. Uh, but of course, every remedy has 
its spiritual aspect too. The deeper you go with randomly, the higher the potency, the deeper um, psychological effect it will have. Um, Dr. Hahnemann, he first proved or tested the quinchona virus, or the quinine remedy, which is used for malaria. So he took uh, smaller doses of it uh, repeatedly, but because he didn't have malaria, he proved it, which means that he developed the same symptoms that uh, the remedy would heal. And back then, uh, of course, you still had side effects from all these herbs. So he decided to reduce the side effects and uh, diluted the, the remedy, but then the effect went away. So he learned that succussion, which is activating uh, the remedy with every step of the dilution, will really bring down the, the spirit or the energy or the imprint of the remedy, uh, of the material into the remedy. So that made it much safer and much more potent even than the uh, herb itself. Similia similibus, a Latin for uh, like, curing like, that's one of the modes of medical uh, therapy. The other one is um, contraria contraris, which is what we use today, um, modern medicine, drugs that have an opposite effect. Uh, let's say high blood pressure, you give something that will lower the blood pressure, uh, acting uh, um, oppositely, in, a, in an opposite way. And of course, uh, prevention, we, of course, everyone of you knows, we um, place a lot of um, significance to that in, as far as oral health is concerned. And um, we uh, have another form of uh, energy medicine right now, which is really bioenergetic medicine, bioresonance, which is uh, really probably the future of medicine. And that also has a lot of uh, backgrounds uh, coming from the The main ideas of, uh, if we try to explain homeopathy, uh, Jacques Van Benis, he, he did some immunology experiments. He induced an effect, an immunological effect in the body by using a highly diluted form of uh, a substance that didn't have that substance anymore. And he, uh, he created an immunological effect. And he proved it, but he couldn't um, repeat the experiment. Uh, nevertheless, it was published in Nature magazine, and it created a big controversy. Um, in Stuttgart, they did a lot of photography uh, of patterns that water develops, which is subjected to different stimuli. So, which means that water really has an ability to retain memory and to um, exert that memory or that imprint to uh, whatever it touches. Because we're made of water, the homeopathic remedy will immediately diffuse through our system in an energy form. Masaru Emoto, he also uh, photographed the crystal formation of water that is subjected to different stimuli, and he noted that crystals will form Beautiful crystals will form with positive input, whereas uh, distorted crystals will form when they were subjected to negative information. This is one of the uh, physical um, principles. Uh, the first one has to do with homeopathy because it's a really weak, very weak stimuli um, that will cause this effect, that will stimulate the life energy. Moderate stimuli, which uh, you could call herbs, spagyric remedies, which are a very mixture of um, energetic uh, herbs and uh, homeopathics. Strong stimuli act as inhibitors. Most medicines, they are really inhibitors. Uh, they also exert their side effects because they inhibit the inhibition in the body. Uh, the body works in a state of homeostasis, which means it tries to keep the balance. But, um, and the balance is kept by ultra-diluted uh, hormones or uh, receptors. So if something really doesn't inhibit anymore, then you have a very strong reaction to something. And the strongest stimuli we use it every day, unfortunately, which are local anesthetics, 
when we give a shot uh, around the nerve, it's such a strong signal that it immediately paralyzes it. And so we treat that as a poison, basically, but we can't get around it yet. Uh, we try to minimize the effects of, or the need for anesthetics by uh, you know, providing distractions, homeopathics. Um, homeopathics that deal with fear or anxiety um, and uh, being very gentle on the tissue. These are just some examples. I'm not going to uh, linger too long on these. Uh, Apis is a remedy that is very interesting. B venom is used to treat rheumatism, uh, but the homeopathic remedy is used to actually treat the symptoms that a bee sting produces. So, like curing like. Same thing with um, a lot of other poisons. Uh, the tarantula has uh, a homeopathic remedy made of its poison. Um, the Bushmaster snake, a very important remedy. Um, Hecla lava is something we use a lot. It's uh, for lower jaw bone infections. Um, it, it comes from the volcanic ash of, uh, from Hawaii. And subjected to this ash, uh, people tend to develop more bone infections. But they also say that it's not only the ash, but it, of course ash uh, contains a lot of heavy metals, uh, sulfur, mercury, and um, uh, arsenic. So it is the general picture of those toxins that causes that. And we use the uh, homeopathic form to treat uh, chronic bone infections that you really can't treat with uh, antibiotics. These are that's the uh, very interesting picture of a stamp from Hecla from 1947. Uh, some uh, sources of homeopathic remedies. And different forms of homeopathy. A lot of these are not accepted by the uh, classical homeopaths, but homotoxicology, for example, was invented in uh, Germany. It makes it much easier to use homeopathics, and we use it uh, to address certain toxic states without having to repertorize or to take the whole symptom picture, uh, because it uses a combination of remedies, not only remedies, but uh, toxins and um, uh, organ uh, extracts. Isopathy or autognosodes, we use the, uh, the pus or the actual bacteria from gums or, or anything really that is toxic from the body itself, we can potentize it and then we can give it back to the patient. So that will reverse the vibration of that disease and will jumpstart the body to cure itself. Modality, uh, there are so many remedies that you could use to treat anything really that you can't say that one remedy is uh, indicated for one indi uh, disease. That is why it's very customized. You have to, you, you get different pictures from one disease in let's say 10 different people and those 10 different people will need their 10 different remedies. The deeper you go in a disease, uh, the subconscious has a bigger role in it. Um, what we fail to affirm makes us infirm. Very interesting uh, quotation. This remedy, as an example, uh, has injustice, or they feel like the person is, you know, being, um, uh, they're dwelling on their suffering. And if you, if you make a cut in that person, you're, you're actually doing surgery, it's a form of indignation to the body, and if that person is feeling that subconsciously, then that remedy will help. Dr. Rekhavik, he uh, invented uh, homotoxicology, and uh, he also um, described how diseases arise. And uh, it says that basically diseases are a way of the body handle toxins. 
if you look at strep throat, it's not really the bacterium that's making you sick, it's the, it's the um, toxins that are created on, on, in your skin or in your cells by the action of those bacteria. So if we really get really badly sick, that means that we're losing the fight. But that doesn't mean that we don't need toxins. We can't live in a sterile environment. We really need to coexist with both bacteria, viruses, and toxins. He invented, he came up with this table. Um, basically, disease arises as an insult to the body. And you get different phases of progression. It's, the common cold is the simple, the first phase. It, you just get, try, you get the body to try to, ex, um, to, um, push out the toxin or the bacteria. If it doesn't succeed with that, then the disease will go deeper. If you suppress the disease by taking antibiotics or drugs, or anything, then it will go away for a while, but it will be driven deeper and deeper. And so it will go from top left to the bottom right, which is really cancer, leukemia, um, thyroid cancer. So these are the deepest forms of the insult to the body, where it's really impregnated. The body can't get rid of it that easily. There's another rule in homeopathy that says that in order to heal yourself, you have to reverse the process of disease. classical homeopathy, he also mentioned that diseases uh, follow uh, a certain path and then they are reversed when you're healing. So, let's say you took a remedy and you got a rash on your leg, it means that maybe you had had that rash three years earlier and you suppressed it with cortisone and then it, and it drove the disease deeper. And now when you're taking the remedy, that same rash is appearing as as it reverses its uh, direction of eating. Homotoxins, these are toxins that I mentioned, they, you, you shouldn't really panic from them, maybe except you know, the heavy metals, but uh, we have to deal with them and the body has lots of ways to deal with them. Uh, there are so many toxins coming from he uh, heavy metals, uh, neurotoxins, um, uh, insecticides, and fungicides, Things we add, like fluoride in the water, which really potentiates or makes uh, the toxicity of lead much stronger in your body. And as you probably know, lead and mercury together will really multiply the toxicity of each one by itself. talked about suppression. Anything that you suppress is not good for your system. We see it in orthodontics. If you suppress the growth of the jaws, it will create more problems. Uh, I deal with that every day, uh, where people have had teeth extracted. The, the direction of the growth of the jaws has been pushed back, and you see people with flat faces, um, undeveloped uh, middle faces, and they develop migraines, jaw joint problems. Even airway problems, they can't even breathe anymore because uh, the jaws have been made smaller just to straighten the teeth. A typical example of looking at one particular aspect of the body without considering the whole uh, biological principle. Diet, of course, Western Price, everyone uh, has heard about him probably. Um, if you really want to follow a proper diet, just think what we ate 10,000 years ago. And I think that, that will give you a good clue. And, you know, the tribes that he studied, they were really very uh, isolated tribes living with uh, the most natural diet. So coming to uh, dentistry and all the metals that are used in what we put in our mouths, some are noble, some are not noble. 
Some are heavy metals, some are um, extremely toxic if they are released from the alloy. Nickel is one of the most highly allergenic metals. Palladium uh, is also the part in alloys that are used in crowns. In, um, if, you, if you have a porcelain crown, you see that little black line. That's the uh, inside metal that gives it strength. And that can be made from any combination of metals, uh, which could include a little bit of gold or platinum palladium, or it could be one of these metals that are called the base metals. Those are the cheap metals that insurances pay most of the cost. So most dentists you know, use that if, if you don't specify. So really, when you look at a mouth, you can have maybe 10 different alloys here. This gold wood may have about four different alloys. The amalgam has five or six. Mercury is half of amalgam. Then we have zinc, tin, and copper. Tin. Gamma phases is what uh, the unstable form of amalgam is called. It's really not an alloy. It's, un it's an unstable form that is made up of phases and it may deteriorate very fast. And then you have uh, the white crown over there, which is uh, really uh, probably a base metal or uh, uh, a silver cobalt combination. Mercury is a heavy metal. Uh, it's found. It's quite common, but it's uh, found mainly as um, an ore, a cinnabar, I think it's called. And uh, uh, right now, it's being produced in uh, very high amounts. And it was used a long time ago in industry. Uh, maybe still is used in a lot of places. Uh, but the, the biggest use is, um, I think the biggest environmental exposure comes from coal burning and uh, from mercury that is being excreted by humans in really large amounts. I mean, maybe we can forget ourselves, but if you look at the constant release of mercury through our excretion into the environment, it, it makes a big, big difference. And then that mercury is also recirculated because you can't turn mercury back into its ore. It's going to stay as mercury in the environment. Uh, just some facts that, uh, I mean, this is available in a lot of places, but it's, it's really very double standard for uh, OSHA to require us to really treat it as, an, uh, as a toxin once it's out of the mouth. But in the mouth, it's okay. We can chew on it and eat. We drink hot drinks 10 times a day probably, which raises the emission of the mercury. We chew on it all the time. Really, I mean, there's nothing more uh, insulting you can do to the alloy outside the mouth than what you're doing in the mouth. And it has different ways of being released. Um, the most harmful and uh, deleterious uh, way is the vapor. Every time you chew, you're releasing the vapor. There's um, a very interesting video clip on the IAONT.org website, and uh, it's called the Smoking Tooth. Um, uh, it's everywhere, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, you just rub an, an amalgam filling for a little while and hold it behind a screen uh, with ultraviolet, and you'll see all the vapors coming up. And this happens every time you rub your teeth together. Uh, they found that uh, the, the pulp, the, the nerve inside the tooth, has about 30 times the concentration of mercury um, as, a, as a tooth that has no amalgam. Particles are constantly released, which are swallowed, and they are being attacked by the gut bacteria, and then the, uh, they are being methylated, that's organic form of mercury, which is also very toxic. And it's the organic form of mercury that we absorb from uh, large fish. Oh, I, I have it. Uh, it's uh, something done 20 years ago. I have all the resources if you're interested. Uh, battery effect. Two metals in an electrolyte will act as a battery. 
especially if one is noble, the other is non-noble, like Mercury, uh, like the picture you saw of the mouth uh, a while ago. There's probably it's probably a generating plant. Uh, you know, the, the electricity is just flowing through your head, and it's also making the less noble metal corrode faster and release more of the corroding metal, which is usually the toxic metal. So anything that really ag agitates it will release more mercury or uh, metal. This is interesting, 13,000 tons a year is released from industrial waste. Uh, it, it will eventually linger for centuries uh, in the environment. I recently read that they found a few thousand barrels of mercury dumped in the uh, Baltic Sea uh, on the seafloor that um, was dumped during the uh, communist era. Uh, you know, the Baltic states, uh, Soviet Union, um, they just dumped it there. It was a common practice back then. Uh, I made a calculation uh, based on how much mercury we are excreting in our feces, which is really 30 times more than what we excrete through our urine. Um, and it, it's based on half the global population. I mean, most people have mercury, seven, 70 tons a year just from our waste. And of course, everyone else suffers. <laughs> we think we're the center of the universe. Um, you know, we're allowed to do any, everything at the expense of the rest of the species. Mercury will exist in different forms. Uh, one is the uh, elemental form. HGO, which is uh, really the vapor that's immediately absorbed through our skin, through our membranes. If, you, if I grind on a mercury filling, the vapor will immediately be absorbed through the thin separation between the nasal cavity and the brain. And that's where the pituitary gland is that governs all your hormones. Uh, but it also will be absorbed through uh, ionization, Mercury sulfide, mercury chloride, they will be absorbed and they generally lodge in your kidneys eventually and in your liver. But it will be released within uh, two to three weeks unless there's a constant flow. So it's like a pond, a toxic pond that's constantly having uh, mercury flowing in one end and then mercury flowing out the other end. So really you will not get rid of it unless you uh, address the source of the input. Adverse effects, um, I just have to caution you not to uh, blame mercury for a specific disease. It doesn't work like that. Mercury is an environmental toxin. It'll compromise your system. It'll compromise a lot of uh, uh, body functions and it may cause disease. But because it can't be pinpointed, that's why that's a tricky area. So you really can't say that Oh, I have this disease, and if I remove my mercury, I'm going to cure that disease. But it will uh, compete for a lot of our important metals, like zinc and selenium. 200 enzymes based on zinc, including the one that actually detoxifies free radicals. Um, and, of course, as I said before, it will potentiate or make the toxicity of lead stronger Let's say you have one-tenth of a, of a toxicity from lead, one-tenth from mercury. If you mix them up in the same body, they'll have, uh, let's say, like five times or ten times its toxicity. Uh, tubulin in cells, uh, it has two effects. One, uh, it was proven at the University of Kentucky that uh, tubulin through uh, from the tubulin production in nerve cells is uh, hampered by the introduction of thimerosal, which was uh, used in vaccines. And um, that basically stops the growth of nerves or brain cells in babies who were just born. 
And uh, it will also disrupt tubulin in the regular cell, and that will reduce the amount of intracellular uh, detoxification because through those little tubules, those little channels in the cells, in each cell, the, body is tr the cell is trying to excrete the mercury that's entered it. So if the tubulin is not there, then that is also um, uh, hampered. Uh, it, improve, it, it increases phospholipase A. These are just details uh, showing that mercury will also indirectly incre increase inflammation, which will also increase the stickiness of your capillaries and make your blood thicker. And that's where we find a higher incidence of bone problems with uh, people who have mercury because the bone circulation is not sound. It's not fluid enough. I think it indirectly uh, refers to that cavitations or you know, uh, but but there are a lot of factors that would cause that. Hypercoagulation, it's called, and uh, it's been proven that these cavitations or these bone lesions are um, really a result of uh, not enough circulation in the bone. Little micro infarcts, we call them, in, within the bone. This was very interesting uh, by uh, Dr. Takamoto. He's, uh, he's a leading expert in. Uh, uh, heavy metal toxicity and cancer, and he, he has these results, you know, mercury, antimony, and arsenic elevated in, um, uh, I think it's uh, idiopathic cardio cardiopathy. It's a form of uh, heart disease. Um, are you going to get into uh, detox? Uh, very briefly, that's a big subject, and it has so many aspects of it that, but basically I will, I will uh, mention that here. The white crowns that you see here, they're generally teeth that have been ground down to a stub. 90% of the time, the old amalgam fillings are not removed, they're just ground away on the top. So, crowns can have mercury under them. And you can see from these tattoos here, that the mercury is leaking out into the gums. The same thing you can also see around titanium implants. Besides the mercury issue, why I hate mercury so much is because they are very primitive. It's a 150 year old technology that really doesn't have anything more to do in uh, human uh, medicine and dentistry. This is what we deal with every day. Pieces of tooth break around it, but the mercury is still in there. It never really falls out of the mouth because they're wedged in undercuts. So the tooth around it crumbles away, and the, the mercury is still there. Besides that, metals have a different uh, way of acting in the body, it's not a biological material. Any metal, uh, I believe, has nothing to do in, a, in the human body. It, uh, it's a good, a good conductor, uh, it uh, creates electrical currents, it expands more than the tooth, and it allows more, for more leakage, which leads to secondary decay, and, and it always creates these little cracks that eventually spread through the tooth and then either kill it, cause root canals, or part of the tooth breaks off, just like you saw before. This is uh, one case which really interestingly shows the tooth split in four by really simple, small fittings. And you see the cracks here. One, two, three, four. Four cusps have cracked apart. They've just separated from each other. So what we do in these cases, we really have to restore them with porcelain onlays or overlays to hold the pieces together, provided that they're alive. <laughs> this is
this is uh, something we find very commonly, uh, two different metals touching each other, especially gold and mercury. We were told in the dental school that even by proponents of mercury that you shouldn't have those two metals touch each other. I still don't know why they do it. Burning mouth syndrome, uh, neurological syndrome. These may come from mercury, these may come from the electrical currents, who knows, uh, but they, they cause, they are known to cause these uh, symptoms. Lichen planus is that white covering, uh, which you find more often right next to amalgam fittings, which are on to, uh, facing the cheek. And uh, a lot of times the lichen planus is precancerous. Um, you have to watch them. This is a, a research paper from uh, results of a research paper from uh, um, another source, uh, which which really it shows interestingly how you get this potential difference between gold and amalgam. So if one is a minus 100 millivolts, the other is a 100 plus 100. So that means that you have a 200 volt difference between them. That's what happens between gold and amalgam. That's what was significant about this. Safe removal of amalgam fittings, these are basic um, principles we follow every day, uh, set down by the IAONT. Um, it's really protecting ourselves and the patient from mercury vapor, uh, particles of mercury. That's really the basis of it. So while we're removing mercury, we don't get the uh, body level rise. We don't absorb it, including us, because we're doing this every day. Uh, the patient is doing it maybe a couple of times a year, but uh, it can the, the micro fine particles of mercury are also an issue. That's why we, a lot of times we cover the hair also because you don't see those fine, fine particles. It's the big chunks you see, and um, you know believe it or not, the big chunks are not as harmful as the micro particles. The big chunk will just it can even be swallowed and it will come out the other end. Um, with, you know, without really causing too much harm because its relative surface area is smaller. Chunk removal is, imagine me grinding the whole volume of the mercury into a, into a fine dust, as opposed to cutting lines in them with a slower drill and popping them out. These are the basic principles um, I can't really encourage you know, one remedy over the other, but you've got to think of it as that toxic pond that first of all you have to stop the inflow of new toxins, you have to open up the outflow, which is your excretion organs, and uh, then you have to start mobilizing it slowly. You shouldn't rush, because it will relocate or reposition the mercury in your system. If you mobilize it too fast with some chelating agents, it will take it from one store and then it will just position it somewhere else. Because mercury is very uh, strong in its bond and it, it may bond to that chelating agent. It will start circulating in your body and then it will go and lodge somewhere else and replace zinc in another system or go and combine with proteins because they have a strong affinity for proteins. It has a really strong bond with sulfur bonds. So any amino acids that have sulfur bonds, um, enzymes that have methionine, cysteine, all those sulfur containing amino acids will just immediately suck up all that mercury. It's stored a lot in fat, so if you're uh, trying to lose weight and do a, do a crash diet you're, and you have mercury, you're going to get sick because it's going to be flushed out of the fat system. Um, it also, before I go uh, on to pneumatic uh, dentistry, I have to uh, warn you, candida, which a lot of people have, is a reaction of the body to store mercury. Uh, it's like a lake uh, we're growing with algae from, in response to a toxin. 
because they absorb, they are like sponges, they absorb toxins and heavy metals, candida in particular. So they go hand in hand. Uh, someone who is chronically toxic with mercury would have more candida. And you can never get rid of it unless you get rid of the mercury. And if you uh, do a strong detox in candida, then that will also flush mercury into your system. Uh, the, uh, I think it's called the uh, burnout or uh, has a name. It's, it's, it's a very strong reaction to mercury. So after you take out mercury and the metals and all the decay, and how do you restore things? You have to restore teeth with things that materials that are very similar to the biological material. And you have to consider everything. Like I said before, if you're straightening teeth without considering everything else, then your airway will suffer, your TMJ will suffer, gums will be irritated because you're clenching because of your TMJ so you're going to have recession and then that will uh, pave the way for gum disease. Mercury touching gums will sensitize the gums. It will um, make the bacteria mutate. That's being shown in the research papers. Um, the whole gastrointestinal tract, all the bacteria living in there, millions of them, scores of species, we depend on them. And uh, mercury will make them mutate and will make them more antibiotic resistant. Root canals are a big issue. I'm not going to go very deep in that, but uh, again, uh, there's this misconception again that if you have, if you're trying to avoid a root canal, uh, you just let your tooth die, but then don't do anything about it. That's really not the right. Um, you have to either extract the tooth or do the root canal. It's the patient's choice, and I always educate them so that they make their own choice. I don't encourage anyone to remove mercury or to remove root canal teeth until they're educated and then they make their choice. And usually I don't really have to convince any one of my patients, they're all educated. A dead nerve really is too, too late. Uh, it's gangrene. If you have a little abscess in the bone and the tooth is dead and, and you want to avoid a root canal, that's the worst thing you can do. It's worse than a root canal, having a gangrenous tooth in your system. But we can prevent root canals by catching um, cavities early and uh, gentle treatment like laser nerve therapy uh, or laser um, decontamination, ozone decontamination. So here you see a nerve that's exposed. Because the laser was used, you did, we didn't crush the tissue. We didn't drive all those bacteria into the pulp. So the laser actually just kind of vaporized the top layers of the decay, and that tissue is healthy. And so we use MTA, which is a very biocompatible uh, cement, to bridge it, and then we build it up. This is provided there's blood in there. If I see that, that spot, if there's no blood, there's pus coming up, that's a dead tooth. It's too late. This is, uh, these are um, my diagrams in explaining how a nerve can die. And a lot of times you don't even see the cavity grow until it's too big because the top shell of the enamel doesn't break down until the cavity has grown and undermined that uh, tooth. So if a patient chooses not to extract the tooth, then we have to do our best and serve them and um, make sure that we're really disinfecting as much as we can. We can never sterilize anything in the live body. You can never get the sterility. But you do your best. Uh, lasers, ozone, homeopathic therapy, isotherapy. A lot of times I take the pus out of the canals and we send it to a homeopathic lab to potentize. And, you, and this is one reason why you can't completely sterilize, because of all the little microtubules 
lining the uh, internal walls of the root canal. And that's also a cross-section of uh, the root canal system. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I think we're out of time. <laughs> we can go on and on.